So good evening from Bangkok. So welcome to the free gemology webinar organized by AIGS. I'm Michelle. Hope you are very good. So I realized this is our eighth webinar already. Uh, I really want to say thanks to all those who have been supporting us all the time. Especially a big thanks to all our uh, guest speakers who have been very kind and generous for sharing their knowledge. So today the whole flow of the webinar will be as usual. After the presentation will be the small quiz and then the question and answer session. Please make sure you put your question in the right place. If you put in the chat, there might be high chances your questions might be ignored. And also, so last time some attendees again in the situation, they can't hear the speaker's voice. So please check your internet connection and log out and enter in again. So this might help you today. So this is all the reminders from me. Now I will give the stage to AIG's chairman, Mr. Kennedy Ho. So he will give a brief introduction to a very popular professor, Dr. Emmanuel Fritsch. So welcome, Mr. Kennedy Ho. So I think uh, uh, today's speaker is Dr. Emmanuel Fritsch. I don't think uh, I need to give much of an introduction because he's already famous and everybody around the world already know him. I will keep it short. Uh, Dr. Emmanuel Fritsch is a professor of physics at uh, the University of Nantes in uh, Western France. He's also responsible for the DUG program, that is the Advanced Gemology Program. He has authored more than 350 articles and he has received numerous awards, including the 2013 Bonanno Award of Excellence in Gemology. He is also one of three honorary fellows of the Gemological Association of Great Britain. So in summary, let's say number one, I would say he's a great scientist. Number two, he's a great gemologist. Number three, he's a great teacher and a funny one also. So what else can you ask for in one guy? Okay. He's so good that I sent some of our AIGS gemologists to study under Dr. Emmanuel Fritsch. Finally, the reason I really, really like him is because ta -da, here he was the scientific editor of my book on mogul gemstones you can see in the inside cover here see still handsome as usual okay. anyway let let me give the floor to Dr. Emmanuel Fritsch. Uh, he will be talking on luminescence. Uh, so please enjoy the talk. And in the meantime, everybody stay safe and sawadika. So Dr. Emmanuel? Okay. Yes, well, now hello. it's like, yes. Okay, uh, can you see me actually or just hear me at this moment? Yes, we can see you and then we can hear you. Okay, cool. All right. Well, hello everyone. Thanks for attending the webinar. Thanks, Kennedy, for inviting me. We enjoy working together on the book as well as doing this webinar. And uh, you noticed uh, Michelle Wu started, Kennedy followed, and I'll be the third one. So, uh, uh, for our American friends or anyone who loves baseball, who was on first? <laughs> Kennedy is on second, Emmanuel is on third, and I'm ready for the home run. So let's share the screen. Uh, okay, I'm told that the animator blocked my, share, my screen sharing. So Michelle, can you do something about this? Ah, um, here we go. Try again. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. This is cool.
Sorry for the delay because that blocked something in the computer, but that's okay. I'm going to deal with it. And uh, it is coming up here. You can still do it, right? I think no, I no, 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 yeah, no allowed it. Uh, if you remember during the repetition, we had a slight problem with that, so I'm being extra careful. Yeah, <laughs> I understand. You can open your presentation in your All computer. right, here we go. Okay, great. Okay. And uh, once the message is okay. Now we're on. All right. Well, so the title of the seminar is Making Light in the Dark. Of course, it's a bit of an expression. Uh, meaning that there is that almost magic aspect to luminescence and it's light when you are in the dark that's created by UV. Uh, there is a lot that can be done actually with luminescence in gemology. So let's start by defining what it is. Luminescence is the emission of visible light that's caused by some sort of excitation. What does excitation mean? That's the way to put energy into the system. And in gemology, energy put into the system will be through a UV light in general. Although we'll see there are many different other ways to do that, some of which actually are helpful in gemology. So you put the energy in, and then you get the energy out, you get the light out, the energy out comes out as visible light. Now, of course, you need to put more energy into the system than the energy that's coming out. So if you want to have light emitted in the visible range, as you can see here, uh, some diamonds luminescent blue under UV light, well, then you have to put more energy than visible. And the next energy domain above the visible in energy is UV. So it's very natural to use a UV light to excite luminescence in the visible range. Now, generally, you don't talk about luminescence in gemology. You talk about fluorescence. Uh, luminescence is the most general term. Fluorescence means that you see emitted light while the excitation is on, meaning while your UV light is on. So that's fluorescence per se. Then if you turn off your light and you can still see light going on, that's called phosphorescence. And actually, there is a new concept now, uh, uh, very fashionable now in physics, which is persistent luminescence. These are actually two different concepts, but they are, for what we do in gemology, you don't need to go into those physical details. Okay. And what we do mostly in gemology is exciting luminescence with photons, with visible light. So it's called photoluminescence which we abbreviate as PL for photoluminescence. So we absorb photons, UV or visible, and we have emission of light in the visible range. So being a teacher, I couldn't resist We'll start with a quiz. Here you have a gemstone, a mounted gemstone, that's fluorescing blue in short wave and red in long wave. Do you have any idea who that would be? So I'm leaving you what? Five seconds to try to do that. Okay, many of my students, when I show them this thing and I ask that question, they say, oh, it's got to be a heat-treated ruby, you know, a red in long wave, blue in short wave. Well, not exactly. It's actually a flame fusion synthetic spinel, an imitation of coumarin. So you see the sort of things you can get out of luminescence right away, identifying the material, at least in part. Now the term fluorescence comes from the mineral fluorite, which you all know, which is a gem, a rare gem in a sense. But that gem often luminesces blue and it often luminesces whatever color. And here you see the typical blue luminescence of fluorite, which is actually caused by a rare ion, europium, europium two plus, that substitute for the calcium two plus in the fluorite structure, which is calcium fluoride. So actually, the term fluorescence comes from a gem, fluorite. Now, there are other things than just fluorescence and phosphorescence. There are oddities. Uh, and it turns out, whoops, sorry, that very recently with the French Gemological Lab, you'll see them 
cited often, LFG. Uh, I collaborate with them very often. We observed a very unusual behavior for a diamond. And actually, while it was luminescing, the color of luminescence changes. So that's what we'll see on a short video here, which is bilingual. So that's long wave, short wave, see the color evolves. So this is what you call transient luminescence. And uh, uh, so this is, this is kind of an oddity. It's very rare in gems, but since we saw it in a quite nice diamond, I thought I would mention it in passing. So there are many luminescences. It's not just photoluminescence, which we just explored because there is different kinds of excitations with an S. You can have, for example, chemiluminescence, where a chemical reaction is what brings in the energy that creates the luminescence. And that's what you see in a glowworm or in all those strange animals that luminesce in the dark in the uh, deep sea. Uh, so it's a very astonishing uh, phenomenon. And the terminology associated with bioluminescence is really interesting because the molecule involved in there has an interesting name. It's called Luciferas, Lucifer, the devil. So luminescence must have something rather devilish about it. At least it's somewhat mysterious. Other kinds of luminescence, if you use electricity or uh, some kind of electric, electrical field, so electromagnetic radiation, for example, you can create luminescence. You have cathode luminescence when you irradiate with electron, and that uh, creates color. That was used in gemology quite a bit. Now we've moved on to other systems. Uh, radio luminescence, it's a very general term for using any ionizing radiation. I'll show an example of one uh, in a moment. Uh, ionoluminescence, when you implant a material with ions, that may trigger luminescence. And then we have mechanoluminescence, when any sort of mechanical action may actually, doesn't always, but may create luminescence. And for example, tribal luminescence is when you rub a material or you heat it uh, uh, with a stone, then it might emit light. And we'll see an example of that. There are many other side, sorts of excitation. Last important one is thermal luminescence. When you heat a material, then electron might be released and light goes out. And so you have many, many different kinds of luminescences out there. Again, we'll concentrate on photoluminescence and we'll concentrate on what the geologists can do with a simple UV light. Okay, here is an example of triboluminescence, uh, which was provided by my good friend and former student, Thomas Heinschwang. So he's rubbing a silica glass uh, to cut it, and you see the emission of orange light by the material when it's being rubbed. And it stops instantly once you remove, you stop the rubbing. Sorry about that. Now, another type of luminescence that is uh, used in gemology uh, is for pearls. That's luminescence under X-ray excitation. So after UV, the next domain of energy that's higher is X-rays. And that is used for the uh, luminescence of pearls. And as you can see on the bottom right, uh, freshwater pearls uh, luminous yellow, and that's related to manganese. There's some recent study by uh, Stefano Scarampelas and his friends at Danat uh, about that. And saltwater pearls remain inert. So you can identify uh, whether a pearl is, is uh, freshwater or saltwater using luminescence, but this one with x rays. So it's not exactly something you can do at home. There's a specific name for them at the bottom of the screen. Now, let's go back to our main needed material for luminescence, a good old UV light. Now, a UV light and UV experiments in general 
are not, in my view, uh, terribly well described in gemology. First of all, uh, no one mentions the power of their UV lamp. But everything else being equal, if you have a lamp that has 4 watt power, you will see less luminescence than if it has 6 watt power or 12 watt power. So specifying the, the electrical power of the lamp is important. Plus, most lamps have two tubes, so you have to figure out, it's not always very clear actually, whether that's the power per tube or for the two tubes together. Meaning if you have two tubes and the, the, the overall power is four watts, then it's two watts per tube. So these sort of things which are very important to evaluate the intensity of luminescence or even if it's present or not, um, are often missing. Now, you know that there are two so-called wavelengths we work at, long wave UV and short wave UV. Long wave is presented as being 365 and short wave as being 254. Now, on the top left, you have an emission spectrum I got from uh, Bear Williams' uh, bit on the UV luminescence on the guide, uh, uh, which presents the emission of a short wave lamp. And as you see, there is 254, but there are also other lines coming in, in particular 365. So actually, short wave UV is not strictly 254. And long wave UV is not strictly 365 because what they did for long wave UV is they actually take a short wave UV tube. It's actually a mercury lamp. And 365 is one of the many rays uh, emitted by the mercury lamp, as you can see at the bottom of the screen here. So you see there is a line in the blue, there is a line in the violet. So these are the, the, the peaks that you see here. And there is some visible light coming out of your so-called 365 lamp. And then the phosphor that has been put on the inside of the lamp is absorbing entirely the 254 and re-emitting roughly around 365, and that's the wide band that you see there. And depending on which lamp you use, it could be 355, the maximum emission, or 370, which seems to be the case in this particular instance. But basically, it's a broadband emission, 365. It's centered more or less on 365. So you see very different material. And an important point, it's a mercury lamp. It emits in the visible. Therefore, your UV light emits visible light as well, and it has its importance. Uh, I wanted briefly to show you what's on one of the UV lamp I use. So there is an indication here of power per tube. You know, there's 6 watt uh, for the 365, and there is uh, 6 watt for the 254. So altogether, the power is 12 watt. So this is important to know these things if you want to properly report uh, the luminescence of a material in an article or a note. Now, let's not forget that we have a UV light, but we have always visible light. And visible light can excite visible luminescence also, because, for example, blue is far more energy than red, so blue light can produce red luminescence. Two examples are shown here, the classic case of the ruby at the bottom here, and a less known case, the red luminescence of feldspar, uh, Oregon sunstone in this case, uh, which is induced by ion 3 plus. We'll get back to that later. Another well-known example is what is called green transmitters in diamond. They really should be called green emitters. That's a sort of a historical mistake that's still in the literature. Uh, actually, the body color of the diamond is yellow, and there is absorption in the blue, and it emits in the green, which is slightly less energy than the blue. That's caused by a specific uh, diamond center. Another example I published on in 2015 is this incredible um, iolite opal from Mexico. So it's opal, but of the rare variety iolite, uh, which contains uranium, and so you have uranium-related green luminescence. And so as for diamond, actually, it's very parallel. There is yellow body color, and the green is from the luminescence itself. So remember, you may have visible light luminescence. Uh, that's uh, not always easy to observe, but uh, in the right conditions, uh, you can see it very well by bringing a, a fiber optic right next to the stone or 
putting it in indirect sunlight, that sort of thing, that might work. Now, not only that, but it's the old observation environment that matters. Obviously, you should be in the dark. So the best observation environment is a dark room. But not everyone has the luxury of a dark room. So there are some devices that have been built uh, to help you test for luminescence being in a not so bright room. And you see uh, two of them here. Uh, at the top, a very classic UV cabinet. Uh, which is, works pretty good. You find that in many gemologists, even in laboratories. Here, a, a simpler at the bottom uh, right, a simpler system. But both have a very uh, a good setup, which is they have a dark background. I want to attract your attention to some systems that are sold on the market, which can allow you to test for luminescence, but on a white background. This is very dangerous because your UV light is emitting in a visible range, so it's emitting in a violet and blue. And that's a lot of light compared to the little light that a small diamond, for example, put under this light uh, might emit. So I've seen cases, there are extreme cases, I agree, but I've seen cases where if you use a setup like that, a diamond that is actually luminescing blue in ideal dark cabinet situation would appear to luminous yellow. And it does luminous blue, as a matter of fact, it's a contrast effect, that, a, a trick your eye is playing on you, that it sees a lot of blue around it, it sees less blue coming from the diamond, therefore it perceives it as yellow. That's called the contrast effect in, in color science. So be careful to have a dark room with a dark, of course, inert background. A black tile will do nicely, for example. This is one of the setup I use. I want to attract your attention to the fact that not only do I know the power, not only do I have the perfect background, of course, I turn off the light and I do the experiment, but I have a fixed distance between the stone and the lamp. Because clearly, if you hold your lamp in your hand, when, when you are very close to the stone, you have more luminescence than when you are you know, 30 centimeters away or whatever, or a foot away for the Americans. And um, so what you need to have for uh, being able to clearly evaluate the intensity in particular of luminescence is to have the distance between your lamp and your sample. And that's fixed when you use a little setup like that. That's very easy to do. You don't have to do it luxury like that. Our workshop did it for us, but uh, it's important. This way you have everything calibrated, the power, the distance, the background is neutral. You do it in a perfectly dark room. So this is kind of a perfect setup. Well, then now you're going to look at luminescing gems and you're going to see pretty colors. Great. What color is it? You have to realize that our color memory is not very good. Uh, if you look at the color of a single gem luminescing under the light, uh, one person might see it blue, the next person might see it yellow, and luminescence may actually be white. This is a trick that happened often uh, between Jim Shigley and I when I worked at GIA. Jim would see things yellow, I would see them blue. But really the luminescence was in between, which is a mix of yellow and blue that is white. So here, uh, what I recommend to use is master stones for luminescence colors and also intensity, we'll see that in a minute. So here you have some of the uh, fluorescence master stones used in the French Demological Lab, the LFG, LFG in English. Uh, ideally, you need all the colors that are possible by emission. So you have red, that could be a simple flame fusion synthetic ruby. Orange, you can find a nice orange in uh, uh, many sapphires, natural or synthetic. Uh, yellow, uh, maybe diamond, many gem uh, luminous yellow. Green, um, I personally like to use uh, uh, pers uh, particular kind of flame fusion synthetic spinel, which is doped with manganese, a very strong green, but you may have weaker green with opal, for example. Blue, of course, there, it's useful to use the blue luminescence of diamond, even if in reality it's not exactly blue, there is some violet into it. And there is white that is often forgotten in the description of luminescence, which is a mixture of yellow and blue. And you also may have pink luminescence, which is actually a mixture of orange and blue. You can see on some diamonds, but 
This is extremely rare, so I, I don't have a good example for you here. You can use any material you want. This is just ideas for you to procure uh, adequate uh, master stones for luminescence color. Now, uh, when you look at the color, please uh, do not note the color of the visible light reflection on your stone because as I said twice now, the UV lamp is emitting visible light. So you may see the reflection of that, that's violet. So uh, all gemology teachers know about that weak violet luminescence, which means that actually there was very little luminescence and essentially what you're looking at is a reflection of the lamp. Now, if you want to be very careful about whether there is luminescence or not, I recommend to use an inert stone as a master stone as well. This way, you see what it means to be really inert. On the bottom right picture, there is an inert stone smack in the center. I don't know if you can see it with the proper reproduction. There is fluorescing dust around it. And um, this is quite useful actually sometimes to evaluate whether there is some very weak luminescence or no luminescence at all. We have plenty of inert gems, uh, uh, some red garnets, for example, or almost any quartz uh, would be inert. So it's not difficult to find an inert stone. Now, of course, intensity is important. And in particular, there is a, a very strong history of looking at the luminescence intensity of diamonds for grading purposes. And as you know, about one third of diamonds luminous, and among those, about 80% luminous, uh, blue, 30% uh, sorry, luminous uh, blue. Uh, this is uh, the, the uh, picture that you see is only for long wave blue luminescence of diamond. Uh, so it doesn't represent anything for short wave. And this is from a GNG article. And um, you can see that uh, Sipjo actually developed uh, many years ago a uh, luminescence set for diamonds, which represent the three stones uh, you see on the left side. There's a smaller stone on the right side because it's been demonstrated that a very strong luminescence may influence the visible appearance of near colorless diamonds. So what you need actually is a master stone for that, what you'd call strong or very strong or intense. So you need to have your own master stones. Uh, uh, there is no series for sale. Also beware of the vocabulary you use. Inert means there is absolutely nothing and none should mean absolutely nothing. You will see that's not always the case. Faint to me is weaker than weak. So should we use faint or weak? Moderate or medium? Well, that's moderate or medium, but compared to what? Then you are strong and then you are very strong or intense. Are they the same or are they different? So be very careful about using a consistent terminology for yourself, using your own standard, at least in a relative way, you will always be right. You may not be right in an absolute way comparing your luminescence standard with those of others. Nevertheless, that's extremely important if you want to report intensities of luminescence that make sense, and especially to have the right so-called very strong master stone uh, for near colorless diamonds. Of course, you can do the master stones for other uh, gems. Here is what I use uh, for red, uh, both for the color and for the intensity, both in long wave and short wave. You can use the same in long wave and short wave. Uh, that reduces the number of master stones you have to have in your environment. But comparing the color, the emission color, the fluorescence color of a gem to a master stone allow you to evaluate it much more carefully and much more accurately. How many times sometimes someone sees yellow, another one sees green, then you put a green master stone in there, and all of a sudden everybody agrees that, oh, oh, it is green. <laughs> Uh, so luminescence, master stones for color and intensity are very important. Now, showing you the problem that we all have with the evaluation of intensity, here is a stone that came with a report uh, to a lab and the report says none. And we put it under our UV light, uh, it was green and medium intensity. So you wonder what happened there. Uh, so there is often, a real problem with having no international master stone for intensity. I don't think color is as big a problem, but intensity is. Another example, this is a phosphorescent diamond. And on its report, it says luminescence none. Why? Because it's phosphorescent. 
And you will see that uh, for a phosphorescent material, you have to wait a couple seconds before you can see luminescence, actually. So probably either uh, they didn't observe long enough the diamond under UV light, or maybe they had a white background or what else. But nevertheless, um, it's important to leave the stone, you know, about five to 10 seconds under the light before you can really decide uh, if there is luminescence or not and what the color is. Another characteristic of luminescence is not often spoken of is what I call turbidity because that's the correct scientific term, but often in gemological literature, you have the term chokiness, even milkiness, and that's fine. That means that light is scattered enormously, the luminescence is scattered enormously. And what happens is what you see on that yet again uh, picture from Thomas Einstein, two diamonds, the one on the left has a blue luminescence, but you can see actually the pavilion facets with the luminescence. Whereas on the right one, you, it's completely opaque apparently. You cannot see, it's very turbid, and you can't see the pavilion facets. You can see the, uh, actually the, the edges of the stone that are uh, stronger than the rest of the luminescence, but that's another story. So turbid means I can't see through the stone when it luminesces. And look underneath, I've taken again that picture, that's part of the picture that was a front cover of Gems in Gemology a long time ago, maybe 30 years ago. And uh, you see a ruby next to a diamond. You can see very well the scintillation coming out of the pavilion side of the diamond. The ruby looks almost opaque. Why does it look opaque? Because it luminesces. Ruby luminesces invisible light, at least the very best natural one and many of the synthetics luminous invisible light. So that gives you that velvety, obscured, scattered appearance of the color. You don't see through it very well. That's turbidity. And that's a very important characteristic to note in luminescence, either in UV or in visible light. Some example of turbid luminescence, amber. And there you can probably relate the fact that luminescence is turbid to the fact that UV doesn't penetrate very much in amber. Uh, it's absorbed very strongly in UV. Pearls, of course, they are not transparent, so you'd expect not to have a transparent luminescence, so they are indeed very turbid. And I give you the third example, uh, glasses, you know, used for imitation of gemstones. Uh, it's a little studied material, but it has often a, a very choky, very turbid shortwave blue luminescence that you can see in some of those stones. Okay, so that's color, intensity, turbidity, and then we have distribution. In other words, saying, is the fluorescence homogeneous or not? And I love this example. I was sent to me from Dubai by uh, Suta Singh Bangrung, uh, who is the head of the uh, 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 Dubai lab. And uh, these are uh, 3D pink diamonds, and they show uh, color zonation. Actually, you can see it on the right. But in the middle, you see the luminescence, and you see that on some of the stone, it's very strongly zoned. And uh, I gave you a more detailed picture of one of these stones on the bottom right. So you have some sectors luminescing green and some sector luminescing orange. Green is the H3 center, orange is the NV center. And this goes back to the way the diamond grew. These are growth sectors. Color or luminescence is zoned because you have different growth sectors. So often you can actually see the growth history not often, perhaps, but sometimes you can see the gross history of the gem using luminescence. That's the principle, actually, of the diamond view system that we won't discuss today because uh, it'd be worth a, a webinar all by itself. But uh, uh, looking at luminescence, you can reconstruct the gross history of the stone by looking at the non-homogeneous luminescence of the stone. Here is another example of non-homogeneous distribution. A kind of a headache when you want to do a intensity grading of luminescence in diamond. You have the center of the stone, the core, which is very strongly luminescing. And frankly, uh, the rest of the diamond is hardly luminescing. It's just blue light emitted by the core reflecting through the rest of the diamond. So uh, a bit of a headache for intensity grading uh, due to a very strongly zoned uh, luminescence in the diamond find the same kind of situation in corundum. 
Yellow Sapphire, for example, in Yellow Sapphire from Sri Lanka, on the top here, you have colorless and yellow zones. And you notice that it's the colorless zone that luminates more strongly than the yellow zone. Uh, and in Sri Lankan Sapphire, that tends to be perpendicular to uh, C, that you see the, the optic axis, that you see the donation. And in Kashmir Sapphire, to simplify the crystallographic term, I'll say it's not perpendicular to C. Many of those pictures come from uh, GGTL, from Frank Notary and Associates over there in, in Geneva. Now, this is another one from uh, that Olivier Segura took when he was head of the lab in Paris. I love this picture. This is a Savorite, it's about nine carats, and relatively light colored Savorite may luminesce orange. This is a manganese related luminescence, probably. But look at the picture on, excuse me, on the bottom center. I'm trying to bring, here we go. You have a very strongly luminescing zone here. I'm stalking around here. And a very strongly luminescing zone here. And another one here. And you have a much less luminescing zone in between. Now, if this is in shortwave, if you compare that with an idealized drawing of a garnet, you realize that actually the strongly luminescing zone corresponds to the dodecahedral faces and the less luminescing zone corresponds to the trapezohedral uh, faces or growth sectors more accurately. So again, uh, luminescence zoning uh, is worth observing in detail and it can help you get back to the original shape actually of the gem before faceting. A non-crystallographic zoning here in the uh, fire pool from Mexico, again from uh, Thomas Einstrang. Uh, here you have sort of cells in the structure of the opal, and the cells themselves have not too much color, but uh, the zones in between the cells have a lot of color, dark orange, due to ion 3 plus. And as you can see in the luminescence picture, you have green luminescence of the less color zone, and hardly any green luminescence in uh, very strongly colored zone. So here you have a zoning of luminescence that follows the zoning of color, which is perfectly logical because that's a zoning in absorption, the zoning of color, and you need absorption to cause luminescence. Now a question that is never asked in classical gemology, but is worth thinking about. Many gems that luminesce are not isotropic. So logically, luminescence should not be isotropic. And so is there some equivalent of pleochorism when you observe the luminescence of gems? Well, the question is, yes, there is, but you can't see it. <laughs> so uh, it's very difficult to observe because luminescence is emitted in all directions at the same time. So you lose the directional aspect that you have with single absorption with one distant source and a rather a directional beam. This is the light is going in all direction. But you do see when you do the spectroscopy of the luminescence, and here I'm showing you the emission spectrum of a ruby in, two di in the two different orientation, parallel and perpendicular to the optic axis, and you see that on one case, one of the emission is more important than the other, and then it reverses in the reverse orientation. Well, both emissions are around 694 nanometer. They're in red, and so whether one dominates or the other, it's still in the red, and you don't see the difference. So it is very difficult to see. Uh, I have read that sometimes you may be able to see a small difference uh, in orientation uh, with uh, Kunzite. You may see a, a more pinker one in one orientation and, and a more orange one in another one, but uh, extremely rare that you can really observe that on a gem, but it does exist. And it's important to take that into account when luminescence spectroscopy is done on gems. Ha. Luminescence can bring a real plus to actually a piece of jewelry, I think. It brings a real plus to a gem. I think it gives it personality. I personally hate people who say that, oh, we don't want any luminescence in diamond because uh, it brings us value to the diamond. I think as long as it doesn't disturb the color, it brings more character to the diamond. And to me, that's more value. Here is a remarkable piece of jewelry that was made in Nantes, my town here in France, uh, by Raphael, you see on the right of the picture. And, for his wife, Vanessa, you see on the left of the picture. Uh, this is a butterfly. 
and the border of the uh, butterfly wings have been set with diamonds, uh, which luminous blue, but see there's a gradation in the intensity of the luminescence. It was about one year, if I remember correctly, assembling all these diamonds, you know, they have to be same color, same size, but a regular, a continuous variation in luminescence. Heck of a job. It gives a lot of personality, for sure, uh, to the gem. Makes it absolutely unique, actually, the, not the gem, the piece of jewelry. Great piece. Another way you can look at luminescence as an identity card of a piece of jewelry is uh, this Napoleon necklace that was written about by uh, Eloise Gayou uh, some years ago, where actually you have near coreless diamond. But when you look at the luminescence, all of the ones that luminous blue are one A or inert, and all of the ones that um, are luminescing orange or pink are two A. Some are more or less inert. Uh, so actually, luminescence gives you the type of the diamond in that necklace. So you see that's another way to look at identification in a piece of jewelry through luminescence. And certainly it gives a unique character again to the piece of jewelry. Now we've described the color, the intensity, the turbidity, the zoning, very important. And we may have phosphorescence, meaning that we may have luminescence being emitting after we turned off the UV light. Now that's not always easy to observe because you know if you are in the dark and you turn off the light uh, then your eyes are a bit lost for a second so if you think you have phosphorescence on a gem you may want to be in the dark uh, let your stone under UV for a while close your eyes and as you turn off the light you open your eyes and then you will see uh, luminescence more easily. Uh, another thing that characterizes luminous, uh, phosphorescence sorry, is charging. This is a magnificent plate, again by Olivier Segura, uh, now with VCA in Paris. Uh, the, um, you see uh, this is the luminescence of one diamond uh, as a function of time. So when you first put the UV on the stone, it appears virtually inert, and then gradually you have more uh, luminescence uh, coming and then if you look at the second line of the plate well you have sort of a plateau so you know you have the maximum luminescence you're going to have then you turn off the light and then in obscurity the diamond is emitting phosphorescence which is decaying very slowly and so um, this is a very spectacular plate of phosphorescence the important point is charging why is it called charging? Because for those of you who know about the physics of luminescence, where you have the electrons getting into the right energy level, and you charge the energy level until you can't put any more electrons. And at that point, you can have more emission. You cannot have more emission. And then when you turn off the light, well, they go back to their original state slowly. And that's what causes the phosphorescence. You need very specific setup in terms of energy level to have that. So char uh, phosphorescence, uh, which is accompanied by charging something that is not talked about in gemology, but is often uh, very interesting to watch. You can see that, for example, looking at near colorless HPHT synthetic diamonds. They show generally a uh, very beautiful phosphorescence, and uh, they will show the charging if you look carefully enough. So you have two of the stone, one cut, uh, one rough, you see them under shortwave UV, and you know you're under shortwave because you see light reflection, and you see the luminescence of the dust. You can also see there is some zoning here, clearly here. There's another one perpendicular. There's an inner zone going through here, through here, and here you can't see very much. But uh, So uh, the phosphorescence will carry, actually, the information on distribution, non-homogeneity, as well as the luminescence wheel. Then you turn off the light, you don't see the dust anymore, you don't see the light reflection anymore, you get the picture on the bottom right. You still see the zoning of the luminescence. I've lost my pointer, here it is. You do see the zoning of luminescence, and even here you can see there's sort of a cross pattern, which is the cubic sector versus the octahedral sectors and that sort of thing. So again, zoning, color, luminescence, brings you back to how the stone grew, what shape it had, what crystal, well, what growth sectors were involved in the growth of that specific gem. 
So phosphorescence can help you see that as well. Common with HPHT synthetic diamond that are near colorless. Now, natural diamond, of course, can be phosphorescent. And sorry for the videos, that's uh, not the right orientation, but I couldn't turn it around. Uh, that's a short video that was made by Thomas Einschung uh, uh, a couple of days ago at my request. So we start the video. You see the chameleon diamonds, then he's going to irradiate them with UV light. Turn off the light, irradiate with UV light. You see very, very strong luminescence. And then when you turn off the light, you see a phosphorescence. Uh, for chameleon diamonds, the emission is yellow, the phosphorescence is yellow as well. If the luminescence is white, then phosphorescence will be yellow. And see, you can still see the stone after quite a few seconds. And if you are truly in darkness, uh, that can last for quite a long time. So here we start again, and you see it again decaying very slowly. The phosphorescence of chameleon diamonds is uh, one of the longest phosphorescence I know in gems. Very fun to play with if you have a, a chameleon diamond, even a small one, it doesn't matter the size. The, uh, quality of the phosphorescence is actually almost an identifying feature of the chameleon diamonds. Another thing that is not taught in classical gemology, but I think everybody should try because it's been reported uh, since the 60s uh, by, among other, Robert Cronenshield, uh, uh, who passed away, but uh, Bob Cronenshield was a fantastic gemologist with an extremely good sense of observation. He was a botanist by trade, so he was used to observe things. And actually, he used a simple, good old handheld spectroscope uh, looking at the emission of light. He was right, this is light. Looking at it with a spectroscope, I'll see the spectral composition of the light. So you can do that. You just have to be a little careful not to put UV light straight in your eyes. So you may use sunglasses or you may devise some sort of protection that's satisfactory. But uh, it's a very interesting exercise and you can see differences, actually, even for the same color and the same material. Uh, we'll see that a little later. Now, one of the things that we've learned to do in gemology is to compare long wave to short wave. And usually you have the same color, but not always. Usually it's more intense in long wave than in short wave. And uh, here you have uh, a study of the orange luminescence of corundum. As you can see on the left side, there's all sorts of colors. There is natural, there is synthetic, there is treated. Uh, there is a selection of those that luminesce orange. And in short wave, many luminesce blue. And if you look on the bottom left of the plate, you will see that some fluoresce orange and blue in short wave. And actually, they were inert and orange in long wave, meaning you have a zone luminescence yet again. So it's one way you can evaluate the luminescence. There is physics behind it, uh, why the short wave and long wave may have different colors. Actually, you may have different colors as you irradiate the stone, if I may say so, with various kinds of UV, actually. So um, it's always important to specify which wavelength specifically you use, or if you use a lamp, uh, and which lamp, and at which quote-unquote wavelengths you used it, uh, if you want to describe a luminescence experiment. Correctly. Now here's an example also from Olivier Dug, uh, looking at the luminescence at 365 in the center, so that's your standard wavelengths. But look at 400, the color is a bit different, whereas at 340, it's virtually the same, but maybe a little more intense. And you can see actually on the flame fusion synthetic ruby broken in two, that is at the bottom, that you can see the depths of penetration of the exciting light at 400, 365 or 340 into the stone. And you can even see for the 330 that the light is coming out. You see a little bit of blue light coming out. That's really the ultraviolet that's uh, uh, captured by the detector of the camera, which is not exactly working the same as the eye. Now, we can explain that. And it's interesting to relate luminescence to depths of penetration. Uh, if you look at an absorption spectrum over ruby, if you had 400 here, that's the dark mark at the bottom of the spectrum, you see you have loads of absorption here. It absorbs a lot. Therefore, the beam is stopped very quickly because of the strong absorption. 
But because there is long absorption, there is a lot of luminescence. You see, it's almost white. There is so much luminescence. It's actually just the detection of the camera. It's all red, of course. Now, if we go to an intermediate wavelength, which in this case happens to be 365, you see there is about half the absorption at 365, there is at 400. So actually, the beam penetrates much further. That's what you can see. But also, you can see the beam tapers, meaning it's going to be soon be totally absorbed within that particular size gem. And then, if you do the experiment at, four, at 340, sorry, if you look 340, now you are almost in a transmission window, very little absorption. So the beam goes straight through the stone because there is very little absorption. But because there is very little absorption, there is also very little emission. Because remember, to have emission, to have fluorescence, you need to have absorption first. So this simple experiment, well, if you can produce those several wavelengths, is uh, very enlightening about how luminescence is produced how uh, certain wavelengths penetrate or do not penetrate in certain gems and so forth. A classic experiment comparing short wave with long wave is to look at synthetic diamond, but this time the yellow, the early yellow HPST synthetic diamond, they're still on the market, by the way. And one of their characteristic, identifying characteristic, is that they tend uh, to luminous much more strongly in short wave than long wave. That can be modified in a number of ways, but sometimes you do find in the lab uh, diamonds, yellow diamonds, uh, that luminous uh, stronger in short wave than long wave, and that is strong suspicion of synthetic origin. So here you have a set of yellow diamond in a, on a sorting plate, you see with a little hole for each of the diamonds, and a, short wave, a long wave UV, sorry, and you see some luminous blue, many are inert and some luminous strong yellow, and if you go to short wave, oops, they luminous less, except for the two that are in the center of the red, two red circles. So let's do it again, long wave, and you see the two in short wave, and then you remember that picture, you go back in long wave, you see they don't luminous in long wave, they luminous only in short wave. This is a strong indication of synthetic origin. There are some very, very rare natural diamond that may luminous stronger in short wave. They're an absolute rarity, they are collector's item. Now, um, sometimes there is no luminescence, uh, or the luminescence is diminished. Often you hear that iron kills luminescence, something you probably heard in your gemology classes. Well, this is what is properly called luminescence quenching. Quenching is the correct physical term, say that there is less luminescence than we expect. And uh, that is what you see on the top right. You have a very intensely luminescing ruby, a moderately luminescing ruby and a very weakly luminescing ruby. And uh, the one luminescing weakly, uh, more weakly on the right in particular, is loaded with iron. The one in the middle has intermediate iron and the one on the left has very little iron. And why does iron actually quench luminescence? Well, actually everybody says it's iron. It's not iron. To be specific and correct, it's the oxygen two minus iron three plus charge transfer. So it's not the isolated ion 3 plus uh, which uh, provokes that phenomenon. If you have isolated ion 3 plus, it may even luminous. We saw that in first part. But if you have the charge transfer, which is very common in many, many gems, uh, we have ion 3 plus, it has a charge transfer. That is the absorption you see on the top right here, this absorption. It absorbs all the UV, uh, it spreads into the visible and cuts off the blue violet. And then, of course, you have no absorption in the blue violet. Therefore, you have less emission in the red. So actually, it's not iron that kills the luminescence. It's the oxygen ion 3 plus charge transfer that kills the luminescence. It absorbs the UV. And that's how it kills the luminescence. To illustrate the fact that you just have to absorb UV, whatever absorbs UV, to kill the luminescence, uh, we'll demonstrate that with sunscreen. So we know that iron kills luminescence because it absorbs UV. We know that air aggregates, for example, in diamond, they absorb in the UV, they don't give any color, but they kill the luminescence in diamond. This is a, an air aggregate, is a pair of nitrogen atoms, impurities in diamond. And now let's try what we can see on the red luminescence of a tuctopite 
Those who don't know tectopide, it's was called barium satellite. So it gives you an idea. It's close to satellite. There's barium in it. Now you see on the right the sunscreen. You see on the left the tectopide. Let's watch that short video. We're going to demonstrate on tectopide, a rare silicate from Greenland, that sunscreen actually is a luminescence quencher, as a luminescence quencher acts as sunscreen that is absorbs the UV. So you see the sunscreen on the right, the pink tectopite on the left. Now you see the red luminescence of the pink tectopite, which is due to iron 3 plus. And now we take the sunscreen. I put a little bit on my finger and I just put my finger on there and you see that sunscreen absorbs the UV and the luminescence totally disappears. So uh, you see that um, it's just absorbing UV that kills the luminescence and uh, the, the iron related charge transfer does that, the air aggregates do that in diamond as well. Another way to quench the luminescence is to put too much uh, luminescing centers in any material. And it's exemplified here with ruby. I didn't put you another picture of ruby luminescence. You know that very well. But uh, the, uh, the figure on the right actually uh, illustrates the intensity of luminescence as a function of chromium concentration in flame fusion synthetic ruby. And what you realize is as long as your system is very diluted, as long as you have very low concentration of uh, chromium, this is on the left of the diagram here, you have almost a linear relation between the concentration of chromium and luminescence. The more chromium I put, the more luminescence I get. And then comes a point around 0 0.2 where the uh, curve is no longer linear, starting to curve in. And then you, point, you get to a, a plateau actually around or maximum around approximately 0.6% uh, weight chrome in the synthetic ruby. And if you, can, if you add more than 0.6% uh, uh, chromium in a ruby, well, then you see the luminescence decreases and actually it completely kills the luminescence uh, if you get to about between 1% and 2%, actually. So if you have a synthetic ruby, with one, uh, between one and 2% chromium 3 plus in it. It'd be very dark to start with because there's lots of absorption, but the chromium see each other. See, one chromium uh, ion is gonna emit red, but the next one to it will absorb that red and then will re-emit, but the next one to it will reabsorb that. So overall, statistically, you have very, very little emission. So it very efficiently quenches or reduces the luminescence. That's what is called self-quenching or self-absorption as well. That works for any sort of um, uh, luminescent center, actually. Here is just an illustration with Ruby. Now let's talk about it uh, a little bit about the cause of luminescence. Well, the cause of luminescence is called in physics an activator because it activates the luminescence, or phosphor, or luminophore, and there, well, you can call it luminescing center, many names for it. And actually, it covers about the same category as the causes of absorption, unsurprisingly. That is the causes of color. And we'll find uh, some of the same categories, in particular, dispersed metal ion, like chromium 3 plus uh, uh, colors gems, will induce luminescence in gems. Well, uh, those ions that color gems are generally titanium, vanadium, chromium, manganese, iron, cobalt, nickel, copper, and zinc but as highlighted only the three central ones, because only those give any sort of uh, significant luminescent in gem. So that chromium three plus that you know by heart that gives a lot of uh, red luminescence in many, many materials, ruby, spinel, um, uh, topaz, for example, and many others. Uh, manganese two plus is lesser known, tends to give an orange luminescence in long wave when a manganese in an octahedral coordination if it's in a mineral where the manganese in a tetrahedral site, manganese two plus, then it gives a green color. Ion three plus, isolated ion three plus, and not the molecule 
doing the charge transfer, isolated ion 3 plus emits in the red uh, in the first pass, for example. And um, uh, we just saw it in a uh, tectopite a minute ago. Uh, so basically, you have chromium, manganese, and iron for those well known color causing elements. And then we have the rare earths also. And one example I mentioned earlier is europium 2 plus in fluoride, giving the blue emission of fluoride. Uh, so that's a rare earth. Then you have molecules. Molecules can absorb through charge transfer phenomenon. And that's exactly, uh, they can emit as well. And that's what you'll see for some molecules that are important in gemology, like for example, a titanate molecule. That's Ti4+, plus, but not isolated as a molecule. So it's a titanate group, TiO6. And that emits blue in shortwave. Uranyl molecule, that's UO2, 2+. Plus, and that emits essentially green in shortwave. Any tungsten group, whether in a gem or not, will emit essentially blue in shortwave, like in shellite. But that's the WO4 unit, the tungsten molecule that emits, not the isolated tungsten. Uh, same for molybdate. Uh, that's the molybdate molecule that emits, not the isolated molybdenum. And that's why the yellow luminescence of power light. And you'll notice these are intrinsic luminescence if you find those molecules in a structural formula of your mineral. You know, shellite as tungsten, therefore it has tungsten luminescence. Uh, power light is a molybdate, therefore it has molybdate luminescence, and so on. We can have color centers. These are defects in the structure of the mineral. They can be intrinsic, that is, they affect only what you see in the nominal chemical formula of the mineral. For example, if you have a, 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 a sapphire, that's Al203, well, that will be defects that will affect either the aluminum or the oxygen. For example, a missing oxygen, that's called a vacancy. So that's what you see on the right here, vacancies, a missing atom. Or you can have, at a lesser scale and with less energy needed, electrons and hole centers. The hole is the contrary of the electron. The electron is the elementary negative charge. The hole is the elementary positive charge. So these things can be intermixed in all sorts of structure. More commonly, those intrinsic defects, in particular vacancies or electrons, may be trapped by impurity. That's what you see often in diamond. In diamond, uh, we talked about the N3 emission. That's free nitrogen around a vacancy of carbon. So uh, it's an impurity nitrogen uh, trapped at a vacancy. The H3 center, which gives the green emission, that's two nitrogen, a nitrogen aggregate, an air aggregate trapped at a vacancy. And the NV center, NV0, which gives the orange luminescence in some diamond, that's one nitrogen atom trapped at one carbon vacancy. And so uh, it's a mixed defect. Unfortunately, in diamond, there's been so many studies on diamond because it's a model for physics, for solid state physics, and many industrial applications. On many other gems, the studies are not pushed that far. And so the defect structure is often unknown. So there is a lot of opportunity to study luminescence that are not caused by isolated metal ions or molecule in gems. Uh, another thing is that often irradiation may kill luminescence. If you take a, a, a diamond that luminesce, you irradiate it right after the irradiation, it tends to luminesce a lot less. That's simply because irradiation tends to deplace electrons. And if electron is evolved in the luminescence, then of course, when the electron is not there, luminescence is not there. Another thing that can happen and does happen in gems, but it's not very spectacular in gems. So I'll show you the best known example in the mineral world, which is very spectacular. That's a rock here, a piece of concrete made with various species of that rock that contains calcite, calcium carbonate, and vilemite, a zinc silicate, from Franklin, New Jersey. Both of those minerals contain traces of manganese 2 plus, which is the activator. In other words, that's manganese 2 plus that is luminescing. It's orange in a calcite and green in a vilemite. So the activator is the one emitting, but then there is a sensitizer that's added. The sensitizer, who is giving more sensitivity in a sense uh, to the luminescence, is the one that absorbs the UV. And it's close enough physically in the mineral that it can exchange its energy with the atom next to it or the ion not too far from it. 
So in this case, the, uh, the sensitizer is LED 2 plus, which is a strong UV absorber. And it transmits its energy to the manganese 2 plus, which is not a very strong emitter. But because lead is there, the intensity of the manganese emission in the two minerals augments considerably. It's very spectacular. It's one of the most popular thing when you collect uh, luminescent minerals. Here's a short video to show you what it does in long wave and short wave. This is a piece of luminescent material from Franklin, New Jersey, that shows the effect of a sensitizer being brought up into the system. In this case, that's lead. Now, let's turn on the light and look at long wave. You see already an interesting green luminescence from the manganese in vilimide. That's nothing compared to what you see in shortwave. In shortwave, you see the vilimide and also the orange luminescence of calcite. And after I turn off the shortwave, you realize that some of the green areas phosphorus very shortly. Okay, so that was for the activator sensitizer pairs. There are some actually in GEMS, but they, they, they don't do something very spectacular. All right, let's review some common luminescence in GEMS. Diamonds, of course, to start with. So we elaborated a lot on the N3 defect that gives the blue luminescence, three nitrogen on the vacancy. The H3 defect, uh, two nitrogen and A aggregate trapped at a vacancy. Uh, giving the green emission. So these are pretty well known. Notice that the H3 center is what uh, gives the uh, green uh, so-called transmitters that could be gold emitters. Uh, so uh, green luminescence excited by visible light in the blue and the violet. So these are common emissions. In diamond, you have also the yellow emission. That's the one you see in chameleon diamonds, among others. It's linked to the 418 nanometer band and probably linked to oxygen, we think, uh, with Thomas and others, Thomas Heinstrungs and others. Um, another common uh, luminescence in diamond. Orange luminescence can be due to several causes, actually, in diamond. Here are just illustrate two extremes, which you could distinguish, actually, using a, a handheld spectroscope. This one uh, is emitting a strong NV0, nitrogen vacancy, neutral charge, uh, center, which is at uh, 575, but therefore emits just above that, and combined with the sensitivity of the eye that gives an orange color. So this is a sharp band with a specific uh, structural emission. Now, another stone emits orange as well, but in this case, that's a broad band. You could see the difference, actually, using uh, your handheld spectroscope. Uh, the blue spectrum, it's at room temperature, you see even more at low temperature as usual. So, uh, orange luminescence in diamond can be caused by different things. Uh, corundum, most common luminescence. There are many more diamond luminescences, but I didn't want to insist further. Plus, we're running out of time. Uh, of course, uh, you know the luminescence of corundum. There are actually only three causes of luminescence in corundum that I know of. Red, of course, that's chromium 3 plus, very common in gem, ruby, spinel, topaz, you have it. Uh, let me remind you that actually ruby is the first solid state laser that was discovered by Theodore Mayman in May 1960. So we're in May 2020, so that's 60 years that the ruby laser was invented. That's the most common and best known uh, luminescence in corundum. Then you have the shortwave blue luminescence, and I just told you that that shortwave blue luminescence common in heat treated corundums, for example, but you can see it on some synthetics and uh, treat other treated corundums, is due to titanate groups. And that, that same shortwave blue luminescence you will observe also due to the titanate group in a uh, gem like benitoite, for example. Orange luminescence in long wave uh, 
remain a bit of an unknown uh, for a long time until beryllium diffusion came about. And beryllium diffusion induces orange luminescence in corundum. You can see that on the color zone, partly beryllium diffused uh, pink sapphire from Madagascar on the right. You see that the orange created by the absorption is only on the rim, and only on the rim do you have the orange luminescence. But you can find it in natural, synthetic, and treated diamond, uh, corundum sorrow as well. So we knew it was due to beryllium because beryllium is 2 plus. So you replace a 3 plus, aluminum 3 plus, by a 2 plus, then that at the if you created a hole, and so it's called a hole center. So it's related to 2 pluses. Uh, two plus ions, maybe the same for magnesium, actually, in corundum, any two plus. So we're studying currently this, and uh, we hope to come up with a more detailed explanation soon. Uh, here is a good example taken from the Mogok book, actually, because it was said for a long time that if a yellow sapphire, you missed orange, uh, it came from Sri Lanka. You can find that in old editions of the Webster's, for example. Actually, that's not true. Here is a beautiful example uh, coming uh, from Mogok, uh, taken on the trips that uh, we took uh, to write the book on Mogok. And uh, there, it may be caused by uh, magnesium 2 plus, for example. We didn't study further that particular sample. Not even sure if we got it, but yeah, uh, Thomas must have it. But uh, a very uh, spectacular uh, example as well of zonation of the color. Oh, quartz is generally inert uh, in all of these color varieties. Uh, luminescent quartz is uh, actually bizarre. However, you can have uh, inclusions in the quartz that contain uh, hydrocarbon inclusion, uh, which will luminesce in visible light or in UV. That's what you see here. Visible light, you combine the, the blue of the emission with the yellow of the body color that gives you sort of a green. And in UV, it's a bright blue. And it's quite a fun to look at those inclusions under uh, the microscope and to photograph them. There was a big find uh, some years ago in Baluchistan, in Pakistan. Now, feldspar, very, very common uh, uh, mineral on the surface of the earth, a, a rare a, a gem that is not so often uh, used, but moonstone is a good example. And uh, moonstone can have this luminescence blue in long wave and red in shortwave. And <coughs> red in shortwave in feldspar is due to iron 3 plus. We said that at the very beginning, isolated iron 3 plus. You have a blue luminescence in shortwave, very common in feldspar, helps to re recognize actually some feldspar, especially if they contain potassium, the, the potassium feldspars. Now in long wave, it's blue. That's well known in many feldspar, and that's called a blue band because we don't know what it's caused by. Probably one of those intrinsic defects uh, I mentioned earlier. So here you have the combination of blue in long wave, white in visible light, red in short wave, and lo and behold, that's the French flag. I'm, I'm talking to you from France, so I thought I should put the French flag somewhere in there. Ah, some very recent research that uh, was finished actually to tell you the truth. The article was accepted a few days ago. This work done by my PhD student, Theodore Blumentritt, on uh, scapolite, natural and synthetic scapolite powder. I don't get excited about gems, uh, synthetic gem scapolite. Uh, you may have heard of the photochromic or tenebrescent scapolite. That's the uh, scapolite is the family. The exact species is marialite. And uh, in that species, you have chlorine. And chlorine may be replaced by sulfur. And when you have the polyanion uh, with uh, sulfur or polysulfide anion, S2, that's two sulfur ions, with a global charge of minus one, then that induces the orange luminescence of scapolite. Uh, we could prove that the presence of sulfur was necessary with the full demonstration through theoretical calculation by my friend Camille Latouche. And you see the excellent fit of theory to experiment, or calc for calculated, uh, that you see for that emission. Very similar thing happened in sodalite, which is very close to scapolite. The ride uh, you know, the one that is also photochromic. Well, it fluoresces orange, and the orange luminescence is most likely also due to S2 as a dimer of, sul of uh, uh, sulfur uh, atoms. One minus, S2 minus, not S2 
two minus, as you can see in some books. Tectopite, I show you the luminescence. Uh, you may see that the one on the right has some orange luminescence, not obvious on this shot, sorry. But the orange is also caused by S2 minus, and the red uh, caused by iron strippers, as I told you many times now. Uh, flame fusion synthetic spinels, beautiful plate here showing the short wave blue and long wave red luminescence of synthetic spinel. Uh, just the reverse actually of what you see in first part. That's what I showed you early on in the presentation on the first slide. Uh, if you do the emission, you realize the red is chromium, no surprise. The blue is not identified as yes, probably one of those intrinsic defects sometimes called the blue band, but that doesn't tell you anything about what it really is. Red is not surprising. But actually, even when you, have, uh, when you see the blue on the left, if you do the spectrum, you see that there's actually also red emission. But the eye is so much more sensitive to the blue that it doesn't perceive the red. Now you see another type of luminescence here, which is a green luminescence of manganese-doped uh, flame fusion synthetic spinels, which I suggested to use as color reference, actually, if, if, you, if you want some for luminescence. And here is the work we did on that. Uh, you have emission around 512, so in the green, that's what you see. There's also emission in the red here due to the chromium, but the eye doesn't see it. And when you look at the wavelengths that can excite that red emission, you have a figure like that that is created, which is identical to the absorption of manganese 2 plus in spinel. Therefore, the luminescence is due to manganese 2 plus. So a pretty clean, I would say, example, manganese 2 plus absorbing and emitting at the same time. Opals, we studied a lot the luminescence of opal, in particular with Eloise Gayou through her PhD. And um, there are a few types of luminescence for actually in, uh, in opal, you have a, a blue luminescence, which is due to intrinsic defects. Due to non-branding oxygen, you can see the atomic models on the right. You should you have um, chemical bonding that should happen along with tetrahedron uh, with four oxygen, but sometimes you have only two oxygens, so you have two free bonds, non-attached bond, non-branding oxygen, uh, or you have only one. So those two will emit in the blue, and the band that you see is a combination of the two various proportions. So that's blue emission in opal, intrinsic defect related to oxygen. Green emission in opal is due to the uranyl molecule. And you need only one ppm uh, of uranium and less than 1,000 ppm of iron. You know, uh, iron, again, here as a molecule, iron 3 plus uh, oxygen to minus charge transfer to see the luminescence. See, it's a very sensitive technique. One ppm, you have a bright, bright luminescence. And again, this one is also uh, excited by visible light beautiful picture of one of those uh, uranium containing alite by uh, iolite opal by Tino Amid. Orange luminescence, you see it in pink common opals, you know, like uh, the ones from Peru. And um, the pink color is due to quinones, which are uh, organic molecules that are trapped uh, within inclusion in the opal. And uh, those uh, quinones, they fluoresce orange. So the color and the luminescence, the pink color and the orange luminescence come from perylene quinones. I showed you the approximate structure of that uh, uh, next to the emission spectrum. Uh, it's been long that Australians have used UV light to prospect for opal because you have the intrinsic emission of opal maybe mixed with a little bit of uh, uh, green emission that might give you a white emission sometimes. And so either they use a UV lamp in the tunnels or uh, to check if they have not lost anything in the dump, they screen the dump and they have, as you can see on the bottom left, two guys looking at their bright UV light. If there is anything that luminescence, they pick it off, there's a good chance it'll be opal. So that's what is called a noodling machine or a noodler. Uh, the green luminescence of opal, you can see it in chalcedony. The two are often mixed and inclusion of uranium containing opal, maybe just one ppm or two, in chalcedony may create a, a green emission of the chalcedony. It's not per se the luminescence of the chalcedony or quartz. Quartz is inert. It's the luminescence of the opal inclusion. 
We demonstrated that on a cameo from one of the Nantes Museum, historical museum here. This is a Roman cameo here, beautiful, with green luminescence. Uh, and then when I published the article, uh, an, a Spanish gentleman sent me a picture of that intaglio you see on the bottom right. Uh, it has a very bright green luminescence in shortwave. And the guy told me, everybody tells me it's a fake because it luminous bright green in shortwave. And he was absolutely delighted to learn that there was an explanation and it was natural because he felt that was absolutely natural in his view. So I provided him with the explanation. We have two more examples of uh, a red, uh, sorry, green luminescing opal in Chalcedony, a banded agate here on the top right, and an agate, a, a very bizarre concretion from Mexico that appeared on the market recently, also with a spectacular shortwave green luminescence. So in conclusion, finally, we got there. Uh, luminescence is a very sensitive technique. Remember for uranium one ppm, but it depends about the luminescing center. Some can give luminescence at even lower concentration. It all depends on the excitation you give them. And frankly, I think we can make improvement in the gemological community on how to describe in detail luminescence. Describe the nature of the excitation, what is the lamp, the power of the lamp, the distance, uh, the proper background, not mix the reflections with luminescence and so on and so forth. And describe all the character, color, intensity, turbidity, uh, distribution, non-homogeneity, phosphorescence, pay attention to that, it can be missed sometimes. Uh, so we need to improve on our descriptions of luminescence experiment. As I've told you, luminescence may reveal because it induces, uh, it reveals growth zoning, and because growth zoning reveals the morphology of the gem during growth, even if it's faceted, it reveals the growth history of the crystal. Well, that's kind of neat. I showed you that on several examples. Uh, very well explored and very well known in diamond for natural and synthetic diamond using the diamond view instrument, which I decided not to mention in this, uh, or not to discuss rather, in this presentation. Now, I showed you some spectra. I didn't elaborate on the spectra. I don't want to get complicated. The spectroscopy of luminescence is quite complex, uh, but it can be very useful. The easiest thing to do is an emission spectrum. Then you can do an excitation spectrum to know what is causing the emission, and you can do a time resolve spectrum to know how long the luminescence lasts uh, and uh, in terms of maybe nanoseconds or microseconds because phosphorescence you can see with the eye when it's more than one second or something like that. And uh, I think there is a lot to do with luminescence. I've showed you many luminescence we don't know the origin of. Uh, so I think there is one of the futures of, of gemology is to look into luminescence, understand luminescence and derive more knowledge from this technique, even with using only properly a UV light and in the labs, properly using luminescence spectroscopy. Well, thank you very much. I hope you learned something. Uh, it's to you, Michelle, now. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Emmanuel. This is a really wonderful uh, webinar because I really learned a lot from your presentation. I think this is like open a new world for the luminescence. Uh, this will be very useful for the people who are doing who are doing the research in gemology and also very practical actually. And uh, act, uh, our time is a bit over, so we have short time. So please, uh, maybe I will launch the pawning first, so they can have some time to do the pawning. And uh, during the launch of the pawning, I will uh, allow I will announce the next webinar. So can I uh, share the screen? So Dr. Emmanuel, I will stop your screen share, okay? Yeah, okay. Yes, I will share my screen. And then I will allow the next. Sorry. Yes, maybe you can stop the screen share first. Well, that's what I was trying to do. Okay, it's okay, take your time. So I will try to open my Here. screen also. Okay. Got it. Okay. Here you yes. I'd like to announce our next webinar is, let me do the share screen, okay? Yes, okay. So here it is. Uh, our next webinar will be with uh, Dr. Claudio Milisander. So he will give a talk about the traits of the Tumlin group. Uh, he's from, he's the CEO of DSEF German Gem Lab and also it absent Gem Lab. So uh, we will have the next webinar on May 28th. It's also the same time, 
respect time. So we will see you next time. So this is for the next webinar. And let's see how much for the polling have finished. Maybe we give them one more minute. And uh, Dr. Emmanuel, uh, did yes. you see the question and the answer session? Yes. Maybe you can uh, take a look and uh, select some questions. Do we need to, do we give the answer to the, the, the polling first? Uh, yes, uh, maybe you take your time to uh, reviewing the question first. Maybe you can select some to answer. Okay. Uh, I will give you just one minute to see the, review the questions. Yeah, I looked at the questions. And then, yeah, I think we are going to close the polling. I will launch the result. Okay, so still. So how are these questions? It's good? Do you like these questions? Okay, should I uh, give the answer? Yeah, I will, I will end the poll now. Okay. Okay, so I hope that you, uh, yeah, just leave the questions on. I don't see them anymore. Um, can you leave the questions on? Thank you. Yes, I will yeah. share the, now it's the, uh, Okay, so yes, no, I I'm guess sharing the poll results. Lumination is the emission of light under excitation, all kinds of excitation, but for us mostly a UV light. Very few people uh, have it wrong. Uh, luminescence does not influence color. Yes, it does influence color, so the good answer was false. Uh, chromium 3 plus is uh, most often the cause of red luminescence in gem. I think I repeated that several times during the webinar, so indeed it is. Uh, then I have to get to the next question. Uh, the luminescence of gem is always homogeneous. I insisted strongly on the fact that it is not always homogeneous. It can be, but it's not always. So you have to look for a possible zonation or zoning of the luminescence. And finally, it is easy to evaluate the intensity of luminescence with a naked eye. Heck no, it's very difficult, uh, especially the uh, memory of the intensity of the color is very bad in the human eye. So I highly recommend using master stones for the intensity, but also for color. So I think we're done now with those, uh, with the polling. Yes. And let's get to the questions. Yeah, uh, the questions. Uh, okay, I will stop the polling first. Okay. And uh, I will stop the sharing my screen and uh, I will give you the full screen. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> My pleasure. Please um, read out the questions first because attendees can't see the questions. Uh, for example, I have a question. Say, where does the strong pinkish orange fluorescence come from in a natural type 2A diamond? And can we determine its origin in a clearly ancient diamond? Uh, I mean, I, I suppose you mean, the, yeah, specific mines of the geographic origin. Okay, the pinkish orange fluorescence. Okay. Uh, orange luminescence in diamond in a type 2A, that's probably going to be the NV0 center, nitrogen vacancy, neutral electrically center, which has an orange emission. When it gets to be pinkish, it, mean, it means that there's a little bit of blue in it. So probably it will be a very small amount of N3 of the three nitrogen aggregate uh, emitting in the blue. When you mix orange and blue, you get pink. So the pinkish orange is you have a lot of orange, a tiny bit of blue that gives you the pinkish orange. Can you get a, a geographical origin from that? Nope, you can't. Uh, this is something that you find in type 2A diamond wherever they come from. Uh, so it's very, very difficult uh, to determine the geographical origin of the diamond. It's been tried and no one has succeeded so far. And um, is there a relationship between turbid luminescence and UV transparency? Yes, of course. Uh, if it's not very transparent, it's turbid, for sure. Uh, remember the pearls I showed you? Uh, they are not transparent, they are turbid, but uh, amber, which is probably one of the least UV transparent material, uh, has only a sort of a surface, very turbid luminescence. So yes, there is a link. Oh, my friend Rui. Uh, you know, Rui is trying to break the world record for the number of webinars during the COVID crisis. I think he has three now. Congratulations pull a Guinness Book or record. Uh, lead has been offered as a high intensity alternative uh, filtered mercury lamps, but emission wavelengths is not usually disclosed. Uh, do you recommend lead with known wavelengths for UV testing? 
Well, I didn't discuss that, but one of the weapons of the gemologist is a 405 nanometer, the so-called blue laser. 405 is actually in the violet. Uh, so it's a laser, so it acts on the stone completely differently. It's a different excitation. You can't compare that with the UV light. So again, it's very important when you talk about uh, luminescence reaction that you specify with what material you excited the luminescence, the power of the distance, how it was done, because you may have a different color of luminescence even between the classic UV lamp and a 405 nanometer laser. So be very careful with that. Often it will be the same, sometimes it will be different. So be very careful with that, but LED sources uh, will come more on the market. Uh, the lasers actually are LED lasers, and um, they, they'll be more and more uh, used. And I think that you just need to be careful about knowing what is the emission of that LED, and that, uh, for example, for a 405 nanometer laser, that's pretty easy, it's written on it but on other sources it's not. So probably use a luminescence spectrometer to try to see where it emits. And then knowing that and knowing the power, then you can make useful uh, uh, luminescence uh, emission. Uh, I have an interesting question here. Is tenebrescence uh, related to luminescence? Well, yes and no. Uh, there is no general theory of tenebrescence, which is properly called um, photochromism, that tenebrescence is an old term, uh, but it's used in gemology, but you should really say photochromic, meaning it changes color when photons get on it. Uh, so photochromic, you put under the UV, changes color. So that's the case of the scapolite, that's the case of acmenite, uh, to a lesser extent of tectopite. Uh, yes, uh, there, there is a, a change of color. Uh, it is only related to luminescence if in the mechanism that creates a change of color, you have the same ions that are involved. So it's probably true for solar light, for example, but when you have um, uh, photochromic diamonds, for example, yeah, many photochromic diamonds, including chameleon diamonds, uh, there is not necessarily a link, especially for the synthetic diamond, between the luminescence and the tenebrescence. Uh, sometimes there is, sometimes there isn't. There is no better answer I can uh, give you. Uh, okay, now there's another question. This is a <laughs> this is comments from my Australian friends. I, I missed that. Uh, could you comment on uh, luminescence property of the uh, vanadium rich ruby reported in the Mogok book? That's Rui again. Oh God, Rui. Uh, I don't remember uh, to be honest, Rui. So I pass on to uh, Myro here. Uh, tenebrescence or photochromic scapolite to the breaking down and reformation of the S2 unit. Uh, actually, it's not a breaking down, uh, Myro, in a scapolite or in acmanite, uh, probably in tectopite as well. You have the luminescence that's due to S2 with one minus. And we think the tenebrescence actually has been demonstrated in the case of, of uh, acmanite is related to S2 with two minus, not one minus, two minus. So actually it's, it's the same atoms, the same molecule, only the charge changes. So that's why when the two minus is not involved in changing the color, uh, then the one minus will be involved in the luminescence. So that, what, the both phenomena appear at the same time. I was spending a lot of questions on the, uh, does laser UV use only 365? Nope. <laughs> Generally, they don't. Uh, beware. Uh, uh, there are several uh, possible emissions, actually, with uh, these LED uh, lasers. You can have any uh, emission wavelengths, almost. So be very careful about that. Uh, read what's written on the package. Uh, the emission, I think legally in some countries at least, should be written, as well as the power of the laser, because that has to do with the danger of using a laser. I remind you that a 405 nanometer laser is actually not a gemological tool, it's a weapon. You can really make someone blind with that, so be careful with that. Uh, the question on luminescence of 
uh, first part, does Labradorite fluoresce similarly to Moonstone? Yes, if it doesn't have too much iron in it, it depends on the varieties or the localities, I should say. Uh, can you say that all diamonds fluoresce under very low UV? Uh, no, <laughs> I can't say that. Uh, some diamonds are actually very inert, <laughs> very, very inert. You can't do anything with them. Even using the extremely strong excitation, you have a diamond view, they remain essentially inert. We've seen some of those, so no, the answer is no. Uh, oops, a question, uh, are all diamonds which have yellow luminescence synthetic? Hell no. Uh, you have a lot of natural diamonds which have yellow luminescence. I showed you related to uh, that 480 nanometer band, so no, no, no. Uh, only those that fluoresce stronger in short wave than long wave uh, have a very strong suspicion of being uh, synthetic. Does luminescence affect the natural color of gems? Yes, it does affect the natural color of gems. Uh, this known example is ruby. Uh, uh, there is that expression I don't like very much, that uh, pigeon blood ruby, but uh, we know the best quality rubies, the luminous invisible light. So you have the purplish red and not pure red color of the ruby uh, that is caused by absorption of chromium plus. And on top of that, you have the luminescence of chromium plus, which come from all directions and sort of give a more luminous more velvety aspect to the color. And sometimes you can even see that on the picture. Look at uh, pictures of ruby. Some you can see the pavilion faces, some you count. If you count, it's either because the picture is really bad, but it could be if it's a good picture because you have a lot of luminescence. So for ruby, luminescence influences color. For diamond, the green transmitters, luminescence color. It influences color. There is even some blue transmitters actually in diamond. Uh, in opal, it can influence the color, uh, and so on and so forth. So yes, luminescence in some rare cases influences color of gemstones. Uh, is there a practical method to distinguish fluorescence and scattering? Good questions in physics. Um, actually, uh, if you train your eye for that, you, after several years of training, like myself, you start to guess that what is fluorescence and what is scattering uh, because they don't quite look the same. But uh, not easy. It takes a lot of experience. I honestly don't know how to put that in words very, uh, uh, very well. Actually, in physics, a fluorescence experiment is considered a scattering experiment. So really, fluorescence is part of scattering. It looks a little bit different, but it's really uh, considered the same geometry uh, type of phenomenon. So uh, very difficult to uh, distinguish between the two in a practical way. Let me check some more question. Yeah, maybe one more question because the time is already passed a long time, yeah. Uh, what about cobalt two plus luminescence in spinel uh, What's your point of view? Uh, well, I have done uh, emission spectra of uh, red luminescence in uh, blue spinel, if that's what you're referring to. It's caused by chromium, not cobalt 2+. plus. So it's not cobalt emission. That's why I said cobalt doesn't cause any luminescence. It's chromium luminescence that you see in the cobalt color ganospinels, not cobalt luminescence, chromium. Okay, so um, any more questions? Do you want to answer? Or oh, I think that's you it. That right? was the last one, so I obeyed. You know, I was very obediently obeying to your request. Oh. But if you it's okay. If you want, to, yeah, you can have answer one more question. No oh, problem. Uh, yeah. Good one here. Uh, can luminescence be diagnostic of any gemstone? Well, yes and no. But uh, sometime uh, I remember, for example, my good friend Rui. Uh, sent me a book he wrote about a treasure in Portugal, and he had a blue-white, very chalky shortwave luminescence, and I think it was a blue gem, and just from the luminescence, he expected it to be synthetic spinel. Uh, so that was the stone had been repressed, of course, in the historical piece, and that was the truth. So uh, it can give you a strong indication, be absolutely diagnostic in the sense that there is no question that it is that, no give you a strong indication in, in some cases, absolutely. I think that's about it. Okay, so that's about it, right? I think uh, 
uh, in the future, if they have more questions, they can just uh, maybe send you some message or send you an email. Yes, if I or if maybe I have they time. can yeah. <laughs> or maybe they can study in your university. <laughs> or they can take the degree at not university or answer the questions. Yes. Okay, thank you so much for your wonderful webinar and also your patience for answering all these questions. Yeah, it's really useful for, um, for many of the people. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Uh, goodbye. I hope you learned something. Bye bye. Okay, thank you, Dr. Emmanuel. So, thank you for everyone bye. for attending the webinar. Bye bye. See you next time. See you on next Thursday. Bye bye.